Okay, so last time we introduced radionuclides and, and radioisotopes, and next week's lab we're going to be analyzing alpha particles and beta particles and different sources. And so I wanted to uh, dedicate a lecture to how we measure these things. So we, just because you have the particles doesn't mean you can find them and so on. So how do we measure them? We'll talk about measurement and, and then the, the mess that is radioactivity units. So it's it, it took me a while to figure out what's a sievert, what's a rim, what's a gray, what's a becquerel, what's a curie, all of these are radioactive units. It counts per minute, counts per second. Those are kind of obvious, but what, what's it counting? Is it disintegrations? Is it detector counts? So how do we make sense of all of the different kinds of units that are associated with radiation measurements? So that's, it takes a while. There's a whole page of, really two pages of them in the notes. So this is how we measure radioactivity. These are uh, Geiger-Muller tubes, and they have a little chamber here. This is a pancake probe. You see it looks like a pancake. And if you were to look inside there, there's a little mylar film. It's really thin that the particles can go through. So an alpha particle or a beta particle can make it through that film. Now if it's a gamma ray, it's not stopped by really anything. It, it can be absorbed by nuclei. And so you just need a big nucleus to absorb a gamma ray. So lead shielding, that's why we use lead. One, it's cheap. It's everywhere in nature. And so we can just get a lot of cheap lead and put it in a sack and like compress that sack, make a little cloth. And that's why they put the lead blanket on you when you get your dental x-rays and so on. So that's blocking the radioactive particles, but also gamma rays. Um, but since gamma rays go through lighter materials like iron and other things, you can detect gamma rays through the back of the probe. So the alpha particles and the beta particles can't get through the back of the probe, but they can get through the front of the probe. And so, um, this is a, a radiation counting device. This is an area monitor. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to show the video here. We turn it on. Now this one is um, the kind that I was uh, that I used whenever I was working uh, at Pantex in the nuclear area, where um, we went on a went on a special project at another facility where they had special nuclear material and. They, they mark out the regions where the radioactivity is supposed to be, like if you're going to work with it. Like this desk would have um, purple and yellow striped tape around it, we say a you know, radiation control area, and you would work with whatever radioactive material was there. And then before you left that room, you had to survey your hands and your feet. Like if there was a spill on the floor and you didn't notice it, your shoes would pick it up, and then you would track it all over the facility and really create a problem. And so you had to use a pancake probe like this. So it's showing high alarm on something. And so um, you would check your hands with the pancake probe, check your feet with the pancake probe, and so on. So, so in order to calibrate the, the counter, um, you would buy these little sources. And so this has some little sources in it. They're pretty weak. They're not they're not a danger for health, but they're hot enough that a detector can detect it. And so you have all these little sources in here. Um, we're going to pick this one. Let's see. Some of these have already uh, disappeared. Like here's one. Here's a source. There's a cobalt 57 source. And on the back, you can see it's got a little date and an activity on there. And it says one microcurie. And this a particular radionuclide has a half-life of 271.8 days. And that was uh, one microcurie, April 2008. Okay, so this one shouldn't be radioactive at all. And so we can stick this probe on there and I don't detect any radioactivity. So even though this substance says it's radioactive, it's completely decayed away. And so this can go right in the trash. It's just plastic now, okay? And I know that because I, I can stick it on this detector and it's gone. It's not detected. Now, I can't do that with botulism toxin. I can't do that with arsenic. I can't do that with any other chemical toxin. But for a radioactive substance, I can put it right on my detector. And radioactive substances emit particles, which is essentially light. They emit their own light. They tell you they're there. And so that's, that's I think I would take radiation, radioactive contamination any day, which sounds kind of controversial, right? Everybody's so afraid of radioactivity, but I'm way more afraid of chemical toxins and, and even like 10 times more afraid of living toxins 
like COVID or something like that, where you can catch it and it multiplies in you and then you give it to someone else and it multiplies in them. That doesn't happen with arsenic. That doesn't happen with, uh, you know, uh, any other chemical toxin. It doesn't happen with the radioactivity either. So I've always been a little more nervous about biological contamination because <laughs> it grows. Okay, this one is um, cesium-137. Again, one microcurie in February 2008, and it has a half-life of 30 years. So, you know, it should still be there. There should still be some, some uh, beta particles coming off of this. And so that's giving me the counts, but it's also showing a high alarm. It's saying that's very radioactive. Okay, in terms of this probe, yeah. So it has a low alarm and a high alarm. So if you're checking your shoes and everything like that, and you don't see any counts or anything like that, and then it doesn't alarm on the low, then you're clean and you can leave the facility. But if you're, you know, checking your hands, let's say this is, um, I've got contamination on my hand and I kind of got to go slow. I was like, oh, I've got something on my hands. And, and it's showing a high alarm. Now it's also telling me what the um, activity is here. Let me go ahead and flip it over to detect it. You can see the numbers. Do you see them going up? Not yet. Oh, I must have. These cables must not be. Cables must not be. Must be wonky. Is it on? <laughs> That's not good. Yeah, whenever I touch something, it, it must be this thing blowing the cable, right? <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. Yeah. Okay. It's hard to tell, isn't it? But see here, it's telling me that it's 10 millirem per hour. Okay. So as far as units are concerned, what does that mean, right? Um, we can also um, look at this in terms of gamma rays. Let's find one that's a gamma emitter. This one says beta and gamma. So let me go ahead and turn the probe backwards. So now I'm going to shoot the radioactivity through the back of the probe. And, and it's, me it's measuring 0 0.4, 0 0.3 millirem per hour. So that's the amount of gamma rays coming off. It was 10 or 15 of the beta particles. Okay. Now, how do I know it's beta particles? Okay, I get right up close to the source and it's a high alarm, it's at 15. I back off about an inch, it drops to seven, okay? I'm still getting a, a fair amount of radioactivity one inch away. That's one inch of air. So one inch of air would be enough to stop alpha particles. And so you touch real close, you get a high alarm, you back off an inch, and if it's alpha radiation, it would the signal would just disappear. If you're still getting signal at one inch, it's a beta emitter. So that's how you tell the difference between alpha and beta is the shielding of air. You just back off a little bit, and if it's alpha particles, air will stop it. And, and then in gamma, our betas can go through that, and then gammas can also go through that. And so you say, well, I'm an inch away, I've still got signal, maybe it's gamma. I can't tell the difference between beta and gamma. You flip the probe over, and if you still have signal, it's gamma. If the signal drops quite a bit, then it was beta. So, so it's just the three, the penetration of the three particles. Alpha doesn't go very far at all. Beta goes further than that, and gamma goes even further than that, and even through materials. So that's how you tell the difference between the three. So Beta and gamma, okay. yeah. And so you're getting both. And so you could actually try to sort of add up the numbers and you could get the total amounts of each. Um, and this isn't going to be, these little survey probes are, are going to give you, you know, an, kind of a range value. They're not really good for, for um, counting like for research or like really characterizing a material. Uh, you would need a much more controlled environment. And, and so they make scintillation detectors where you put the materials inside is like 
lead lined you know box and it's really dark and they're looking at flashes of light and i'll show you a scintillation detector next so this is how how this um geiger muller tube works you have a an area filled with argon it's a little under pressure you see this micro window is kind of stretched down you see that there's a screen across the top um, that is it is grounded that keeps charge from the outside uh, for this to keep it from charging up. So the outside of this tube is, is grounded, even the front of the window is grounded. Um, and then uh, there's, arc, like I said, argon inside. And then the alpha or beta particles can make it through that micro window. And this is a high voltage between the outer side and the inner side. So that needle in the middle is really highly positive. And so as those particles go through, then you get a little spark and you get a, a, a discharge. And so that, that little jump in electrons will, you can run that through a speaker and you hear a little tick. So very simple setup. You set up a high voltage in an argon gas, and then if it hits a radioactive particle, if you have it hooked to a speaker, you hear tick, 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 tick. That the that's what the noise is, yeah. So that's what the tick is. It's actual discharge inside that tube. And that's why they sound so, you know, typical. now. Now they, they just make it happen, right? Just because that's what we've grown up used to hearing, you know, grown up used to hearing. But, but that's uh, the traditional clicking of a radiation, radiation detector. And so this one doesn't click. It just has the numbers on the front. It's not very satisfying. You have the, the, the loud beeps, right, whenever it goes over at a low alarm or high alarm. Um, and you never want to hear those if you're trying to get out of the lab and go back to work somewhere else. And you can beep. Oh, no. <laughs> I got to take my gloves off and now I got to do a survey of the whole area of the desk and the floor and everything and make sure that there's no contamination outside the radioactive area. I mean, you're lucky if you, you have it on your gloves and you can put that in the radiation contaminated storage, but why do you have loose radioactive nuclides on your gloves? Something's leaking somewhere, you know, and so in order to train people on handling radioactive materials, they use tattletale powder. Okay, and it's it's um, phosphorescent powder, okay, that they put on the radioactive practice pieces. They're not really radioactive, but they put this practice powder on the on the on the uh, radioactive mock pieces, and then as you come out, they they shine a black light on your hands and your whole body, and there'll be people with like fluorescent powder uh, in their ear in their nose, <laughs> in their eyes, you know, in their pockets. So they didn't have good industrial hygiene practices. They were handling radioactive material and then they would scratch their nose. Well, that's terrible. <laughs> you can't do that. And so this tattletale powder would, you know, cause them to fail the, the handling of nuclear materials. I thought it was really a great thing. Well, they got some of that tattletale powder into their sensitive detection area for their scintillation detectors. Okay, so this is a scintillation detector. You have uh, one of these, um, you have this crystal like cesium iodide that when a high energy photon goes into that crystal, it creates kind of like fluorescence. It, it creates a little track of visible light. So this is um, like a gamma ray or, or an alpha particle, beta particle goes in hits this crystal, which is called a scintillator. A scintillation is like a little flash, okay? And so you get this, these little photons and they come in and hit this photocathode, which, uh, which spits out an electron. So kind of like the photoelectric effect. A photon of light hits here and it frees an electron. So this is incredibly negative uh, to reduce that work function. A uh, light photon hits this. And then this is slightly more positive than that. And so that electron is attracted to this first dynode. It hits there and knocks off a couple of electrons. And this is that photomultiplier cascade that you saw in instrumental analysis. So if you've taken instrumental, that's what, what this is talking about. And so you have this multiplication. So you might get like 10 to the nine electrons out of one at the beginning. So that's a pretty good signal boost. So you go up a billion times. And so you can count individual photons. Like you can detect one alpha particle. If it goes in here, you get a big burst of electrons. Yes? Are the um, electrons coming from the dynodes? I'm asking because mm -hmm. if you have, you can't turn one electron into like a million. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. And so these are all charged up. 
Yeah, and so they have an abundance of electrons. And I think of it kind of like they're, they're charged up. So think of like the, the, a, a sand hill where all the sand is just barely on that hill. You throw one little grain of sand and it hits and like 100 grains of sand roll down. Okay, and they hit another sand hill. And those 100 cause 100 each to roll down. And so that's, these are like little sand hills. The potential of those electrons are right at the edge where they'll roll onto the next one. And so this photon hits one electron, 100, uh, 10,000, you know, 100,000. It jumps back and forth and you get lots and lots of electrons from that very first one. And so the scintillation detectors look like this. The, the long tube is the photomultiplier tube, but then on the end is that crystal with a little window on. And so you can just look at these and say, okay, that's a, that's a scintillation detector. You can put those, these are much more accurate in sort of counting uh, individual photons. You can put this in a dark box and then put your sample in front of it. Well, they got some of that tattletale powder on some of their surveys. And so then they, they put it in the box, they closed the lid, and all of a sudden they saw tons of light in their, in their photomultiplier tube coming from that tattletale powder because it was, it was phosphorescent right? And so they would close the box and their radioactivity numbers were really high. And they were like, holy crap, we've got, in the samples they were running were, were from an area where they thought they might have tritium uh, contamination. Like they, they thought they were, they were running regular survey samples and tritium was one of the samples that they test for because if there's tritium out, you've got a real problem, okay? Because it's easily uh, absorbed into the body because you're mostly water. So it's hydrogen. It can get in your body and exchange with the, the hydrogen in your body. And then you've got a radioactive element in your body going around creating havoc. They freaked out. We've got a tritium leak, but none of our detectors in the facility went off. So how are we detecting tritium contamination if none of our gas phase detectors went off? This is a huge issue. And so they sent the data over to us and we were looking at this and we we're like, it doesn't make sense. Look at the half-life. Your samples drop off right away. Chemiluminescence. It's got a time constant that's in the minutes to hours, right? Go in the dark stuff. You charge it up with the room lights. You go in the closet. You look at the little ghost in your hand. And, you know, after a few minutes, it's not as bright as it was. And, and the tritium has a half-life of 12 years. There's no way the signal for tritium is going to drop off like that. It can't be tritium. There's no way. And so we, we told them, if you measure the half-life and it's not 12 years, it's not tritium. And they're like, but these samples came from an area that contains tritium, so they have to be tritium. It's like, no, there has to be another explanation. If the half-life doesn't match, that's not the radionuclide. And so then they went around and they're like, oh, so they found some tattletale powder and they put that in the vial and put it in, opened the lid, charged it up, closed it down, saw the signal, saw the decay. So they were measuring the decay time of their phosphorescent tattletale powder. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, again, the tattletale powder is a great thing, but they got it in the wrong area and they contaminated their own samples. And, uh, and so anyway, it was really interesting, I thought. But that was the scintillation detector that they were, that they were using to detect uh, these. Now, they use the same kind of scintillation detectors um, in Chernobyl and, and the neighborhoods around there to test for their food. So, you know, you got an elementary school, you got the kids, they're going to make a little salad for the kids. They bought the salad from the local farmer's market and they throw it into this um, kitchen, like stainless steel scintillation detector. And they throw all the lettuce in this stainless steel bowl, close the lid, hit count. And if they don't count any radioactivity on the salad, feed it to the kids. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no way to, t to detect pesticides that way. Can't do it. You know, herbicides, think Roundup, you know, they spray stuff on the plants all the time. And we don't have a way to like stick it in a stainless steel, you know, dishwashing type machine in the kitchen to see what's the pesticide residue on this lettuce. Can't do it. Can't find the that way. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, ice cream. Do I have, yeah. No, there's radioactivity. Again, it sounds like I'm championing it, but I'm saying I'm really trying to just overcome the fears. Everybody's so freaked out about it, but it emits light. Stick it in a dark box with a detector and you can tell if it's there or not. 
Yeah, so, so let's look at some of the units. So one disintegration per second is called a Becquerel. That's the, that's the SI unit. Now notice disintegration. That's what's happening to the nucleus. That doesn't mean you detected it. So this is just what's happening to the nucleus. So for the nucleus, if there's a disintegration every second, that's a Becquerel. Um, that's kind of hard to detect, okay? And so they came up with the Curie unit, which is 37 billion Becquerels, <laughs> okay? Why 37? I don't know, but that's, that's the way it is. It's kind of like the 0.1 kilogram <laughs> for points, <laughs> right? Well, that was weird, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, anyway, 0.1, yeah. <clears throat> and then you have detector counts. This is really what we end up with. We have detectors. We don't know what's happening in the nucleus, but we come in with a detector and we look at things and we can get counts per minute or counts per second. And, and so um, you would need to figure out what your geometry was. Like if you were trying to figure out what's happening in the nucleus, then you need to figure out what solid angle is getting captured by your detector. What's the sensitivity of your detector? Does it get every photon or like 10% of them? So to try to figure out what's actually happening in the sample, uh, you've got to do a lot of math and a lot of ways to figure out, you know, how many photons am I capturing? And then I would multiply by all the other wedges of the pie that I'm not detecting, right? And you could figure out how radioactive it was. But most of the time, we just will standardize our detectors with the known, okay? Um, then we have exposure. So notice up here we have uh, what's happening in the nucleus. So these top two are, you know, in the nucleus which is hard to find, like hard to figure out. Then we have the detector, I've already put that in red. But we're really worried about exposure, aren't we? I mean, that's what's actually getting absorbed in, in me, okay? And so this would be the number of coulombs distributed or, or deposited into a kilogram uh, of, of me. <laughs> okay, that's the Rentgen or exposure. He's the guy that discovered the x-rays. Um, Rentgen rays or the radioactivity um, that you know the the um, uranium ore on a photographic plate in his desk drawer. Did y'all hear that story? Yeah. So the, he thought, well, this this uranium ore uh, seems to be emitting em energy. So um, he put it in a in a desk drawer on top of a photographic plate, and then later he exposed the or like developed the photographic plate, and he saw the outline of the rock. Okay, so he, would, so he was like, oh my gosh, this rock is emitting light, you know, so he put it in the dark and that, you know, and so then he um, uh, figured like he got purified <laughs> amount of material and then he took a, a, he put the rock or the material on top of his wife's hand and put the photographic plate behind it and got, you could see the bones and her wedding ring and you could see like the outline of her hand, you know, and so he made the first um, like we'll call it x-ray but you know it was it was not just x-rays it was all the other kinds of rays beta particles and gamma rays and everything like that but uh, he took the first x-ray and so they called them rentgen rays for the longest time so, so then uh that's exposure but but we want to think about the dose how much is absorbed so the um, the rentgen rays you know if they go through the body they might do some damage on the way, but if they go through the body, they've, they've exited, right? So the, the, the um, you know, it's less damage if it goes through the body than if it's absorbed by the body. And so here we can put how much, we can determine how much energy, like ERGS, which is the um, CGS system, centimeter gram second system of, of units. Do y'all remember this? So what is a joule? A joule is the MKS. What does MKS stand for? Meter? What do you think K stands for? Kilogram and second. So those are the base units for the MKS system. And so a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Okay. So how would I write those same kind of mass, distance, time units in CGS. So C is centimeter, gram, second. And so it'd be a gram times a centimeter squared per second squared. So that's an erg. Not a very big unit of energy. 
<laughs> this one professor said, it's the amount of energy it takes for a fly to jump up on top of a piece of copy paper. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it's not much energy. I'll just say that. And so, uh, so then the dose, a rad, is 100 ergs deposited into a gram of material. So if it goes through, it's not been deposited. So how would we calculate that? Well, mostly we just think of the body as water. And so if, the, if this particular radiation could be absorbed by water, it could be absorbed by the body. And so if it's too high of a radiation, it'll go through the body. If it's too low of the radiation, um, I, you know, it'll, it'll go through the body, like radio waves go through the body. Um, microwaves are starting to be absorbed by water, so they would be deposited. You know, light, obviously, is deposited. Um, and then uh, a gray is 100 rads, which is one joule per kilogram. Now, we've got certain uh, radionuclides that we'll, um, we will use to, to calculate these doses. Uh, now, there's also dose equivalence or a dose multiplier. So this, this sort of takes into account the, the harmful effects, right, for biological effect. So typically we're worried about bad biological effects, right? Radioactivity doesn't give you superpowers. It really, you know, typically hurts you. So uh, how does it hurt you? It, what it does is it ionizes water and then you've got free radical water and then that can add OH groups and abstract hydrogens and things and wreck, react, uh, wreck um, mechanisms in your body. Uh, this is, uh, you know, most damaging to the cell when it, when it happens during uh, cell division. And so for cells that divide rapidly or frequently, they're more susceptible to radiation damage and death, okay? There's a chance that there could be a mutation, but it's a pretty low chance. Most of the time it's cell death. And so that's why you say, well, radiation can cause cancer. Yes, it can, but can also kill cancer because cancer divides rapidly or frequently. And so it's more susceptible to radiation. So that's where radiation becomes a cancer treatment too. So chronic exposure to radiation is just a statistics game. You might get a mutation during division that causes that cell to become cancerous, okay? So then you have cancer. But then you put a, a high dose of radiation in the area, and those cancer cells are more susceptible to wrecking the machinery while they're dividing, and therefore you destroy the cancer. And it, it would destroy the cancer preferentially to, to regular cells because if regular cells are not dividing that rapidly, the statistics of their death would be lower than the statistics of the cancer death. So isn't that weird? I always wondered, how is it that, can, that radiation can cause cancer and kill cancer? And again, it's the dose and it's the division time and, and frequency. Um, so uh, we use this Q. So the REM, this is a Rentgen equivalent man dose speaking generically for man, right? And then this is the rad, that's the amount of radiation deposited per kilogram of material uh, times this Q multiplier. And this is what I, I wanna point out here, right here, this 20 for alpha. Alpha particles are bad boys, okay? <laughs> 20 <laughs> times the dose, but this is internally. Remember I said one inch of air can stop alpha particles. So outside the body, alpha particles are no biggie. You have, a, you have armor for alpha particles called the dead skin layer. That stops all the alpha particles. And next week you'll see that a single sheet of paper can just completely stop the alpha particles. And so can your skin. But if you get it in you, if you have scratches on your hand and they get in your body, then it's 20 times the dose. Okay. Because think about what an alpha particle is. It's a helium nucleus. It comes out with no electrons and it rips two electrons off of something. Every alpha particle rips two electrons off of something. And then alpha emitters are typically heavy radioactive elements. They're things higher than lead. So they're one of these guys, uranium, plutonium, protactinium, thorium, uh, uh, polonium, you know, uh, radon. And those are your alpha particles. So if, if you're getting an alpha emitter, you're probably creating a daughter element that's also an alpha emitter. And that creates another daughter element that's also an alpha emitter, maybe a couple of betas. And so you've got 20 times the damage because you're creating all of these daughter elements. If you have an alpha emitter, you probably have a higher nucleus. You've got a higher uh, radionuclide. Okay. And so if that's internal, you're going to get 20 times the dose. 
And then if it's unknown, you use a 10, but you, there's a whole table of cues for all the different elements if you knew specifically what, what, uh, what your contamination was. So this rim is the thing that we track. So this is the one right here. And then we wanna know what our dose is. And so we have uh, the radioactivity in rim per hour or millirem per hour. And so our detectors are typically calibrated with cesium-137, and that was the, the uh, radionuclide I was testing. It gives off a little bit of uh, beta and some gamma. And 1,000 counts per minute um, is typically calibrated to one millirem per hour. Okay. So if you have a cesium source that's given off 1,000 CPM and you have that touching your skin, you're getting one millirem per hour of dose. So it's what, it, and some of the gamma rays are going right through you, so they're not calculated in the dose. So whatever the absorbed dose is from uh, cesium-137 that is giving off a, a rate of 1,000 counts per minute, that's going to be your one millirem per hour calibration standard. Now, if you have something that's a little higher, um, uh, like giving off more alphas or something like that, you might have a little bit different calibration, but it's going to be pretty similar. So we calibrate it to cesium-137, and then we have a calibrated probe. And that's what our probe is upstairs. So you'll do all these calculations, whatever you're measuring in counts per minute, you'll use that thousand counts per minute to convert over to millirem per hour. Because of all our, all our um, uh, what do I want to say, all of our um, administrative limits are in millirem or rem. So you got to convert from detector counts over to your dose. Okay, let's look at some of the other things related to radioactive decay. We learned in GenChem, first order processes obey these equations, right? So these top two equations are the same equation, they're just rearranged. And this, uh, this spontaneous nuclear transmutations are first order processes. And so this activity A, T, and A0 or just the activity in whatever units you're interested in. If it's counts per second or millirem per hour, you could put them in. So as long as I mean, A's, the both A's have the same uh, unit, that's all you have. Uh, you have this, this rate constant, this decay rate constant, which is inversely proportional to the, the half-life. And so if you wanted the half-life, you just swap these two. The half-life is the natural log of two over K, if you knew K. Like if you have a table of K's, you could get the half-life. If you have a ha table of half-lives, you could get the case. So let's talk about carbon-14 and our, its usefulness for, for dating things. So there's a large amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere, naturally, and UV, vacuum UV light can split that molecule into atoms, and now it's, it's half the mass, and so it will percolate higher in the atmosphere. And so if you go up in the atmosphere, Oxygen starts to thin out before nitrogen because it's heavier. And then nitrogen starts to thin out and then you'll get into just nitrogen atoms. And that's why it's called the ionosphere because the, the solar winds are hitting those elements, knocking off electrons and you have a lot of ions up there, okay? And then cosmic rays, uh, which are again, a lot of times they're gamma rays, they're alpha particles. There's also whole nuclei that are just getting blasted out of the sun and they, they come through space and they'll hit these atoms in the outer atmosphere and they'll, they'll sort of get captured by our, the magnetic fields in the earth. And again, remember we said positive particles are steered one way, negative particles are steered the other way, and they'll go through and they'll collide with nitrogen. Now, if you were to go look at the atomic emission spectrum of nitrogen, like you put nitrogen in an ICP or OES, uh, over at tries and look at the optical emission of nitrogen, what color do you think it would be? It's green. Okay. What color is the aurora? It's green. Yeah. It's nitrogen. It's the emission, the atomic emission of nitrogen. What you're seeing is the solar wind hitting our atmosphere and being directed by the magnetic fields to the poles. And when it, when it hits the atmosphere coming down into the poles, it's hitting those nitrogen atoms and knocking off electrons. And they grab electrons and electrons hop back down through all of the atomic orbitals. And when they get into the visible region, we see the green light. That comes out. And so it's nitrogen atoms, the electrons coming back to those mm -hmm. nitrogen atoms that gives us that light. 
Now, some of those particles hit the nucleus of nitrogen and cause it to transform into carbon-14. So that's where the 14 comes from in carbon-14. It was a nitrogen nucleus way up in the atmosphere. Then it is now reactive and it finds oxygen and makes CO2 in the atmosphere. And so if we have this equilibrium of nitrogen to nitrogen atoms, to cosmic rays, to carbon-14, to CO2, then we're gonna have fairly steady rate of CO2 that has carbon-14 in it, um, in the atmosphere. And then plants are gonna fix that into the biosphere. So as long as plants are respiring, they have a pretty static amount of carbon-14 in them as it's fixed. And if we're eating plants, we have a pretty fixed amount of carbon-14 in us. And so we can use this to date things. So like a wooden object from an archeological site um, shows an activity of 11.6 disintegrations per second. I probably should say counts, probably just uh, easier to, to imagine that your detector is counting 11.6. And then you can take a activity of a carbon sample from fresh wood and it's 15 disintegrations per second and the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,715 years. Look, you've got everything you need here to calculate the time. And the thing we're assuming is the fresh wood has sort of the baseline amount of carbon-14 in it, just like that wood had uh, several years ago, right? So here's the, the, um, the rate constant, and then here's the time that we get out of this equation. So this works well. Um, it works better for, you know, time frames that are around one half-life. So this will get us easily to 5,000 to 10,000 years. Once you get out to several half-lives, the signal drops so much that it's hard to tell from background. Okay. So carbon-14 dating is only going to be good for a max of maybe five or six half-lives. Ten half-lives, we would say it's down in the noise. That would be, you know, going up to 57,000 years. You're probably you're not going to be able to do carbon-14 dating for something that's 50,000 years old, okay? But that gets us quite a far, quite a ways back. Here are the other radio, several other radionuclides, and their half lives So here's carbon-14, plutonium-239 is 24,000 years. So the the weapons-grade plutonium that we've made in our our nuclear weapons complex is going to be around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> the uranium-235, even longer, 700, what is that, million years. Uranium-238, four and a half billion years. Um, thorium, 14 billion years. Um, and then we get down to the short half-life stuff like cesium-137, which is our little source here that had 30 years, and strontium-90, 30 years, and iodine-131, eight days. That's crazy. Uh, we use iodine-131 for thyroid tests. We'll get to the medical stuff later like next time um, so that's something so which of these is the most dangerous so this is a, a nice thought-provoking thought-provoking question I mean it seems like iodine-131 is the most dangerous right it's the most radioactive but you can stay away from it okay and not not get it in you okay there's one on here that that is that would be absolutely devastating if we had a uh, like a dirty bomb, you know, like where somebody blew something up. Yeah, you look at plutonium and uranium, you say, well, they'd be around the longest, okay? But that means they're not very radioactive. Cesium and strontium are, are both, you know, 30 years. That's a, just an awful time, right? It's, it's short enough that it's really radioactive, but it's long enough that it's going to be here a lo really long time. But strontium's the worst because you're going to get it in you, and, and it's... It's in group two, which means it gets fixed in your bones. So chemically, it's gonna replace calcium in your bones and sit there and irradiate your bone marrow and you're gonna get leukemia. It's just absolutely like clockwork. If you have strontium-90 contamination and it gets past you know, the detection and into the food supply uh, and people ingest it, they're gonna have leukemias. And so that's the, the number one cancer for radiated contaminated areas. Um, is uh, leukemia because of strontium-90. It's radioactive enough that it's got a high activity, but it's chemically fixed in your bones. And so that's, that's probably the worst one on here. Okay, so when does radioactivity go away? 
the rule of thumb that I always heard was seven half lives. So you can put in here, like do this calculation of what's the new activity uh, if the original, you know, compared to the original activity at seven half lives. And so T over T one half, I just put seven right here. And so the T one halves cancel, calculate that this exponential is 0 0.0078. So that's the multiplier of the original activity. So it's, you know, 0.8% uh, remains after seven half lives. So plutonium would last uh, 168,000 years, strontium 90, 210 years. Uh, but it's nice, I think, just to use 10 half-lives, <laughs> right? You just take that half-life and multiply by 10. So we get 240,000 years or 300 years for strontium-90. So if there's a, you know, a, a dirty bomb that contains strontium-90 and there's no way to easily clean it up, that's going to be a mess and detectable mess for 300 years. Yeah, that's not good. So uh, we live in a radioactive world. All, all radiation, electromagnetic waves are technically radiation, but we focus on ionizing radiation. So if the energy of that radiation is above the first ionization energy of water, then we call it dangerous. And so like UV light, you know, we can get hit by UV and that's not a problem, but if it penetrates the skin and ionizes water, then it can destroy cells. And that's actually what a sunburn is, is you've, You've burned your skin by destroying the cells using ionizing radiation, and then your body has a reaction to that. It has to dismantle the cellular structures and metabolize them and sort of reset your skin. And your body can handle a moderate dose of radiation. It's when it gets a high acute dose, it's your body's response to the dead cells that causes radiation sickness. And so that's what's going on here. We have no detectable clinical effects below 25 rem. Uh, there's a slight temporary decrease in white blood cell counts at 25 to 50 rem. You can get nauseous and you can do this from a sunburn. You can get a sunburn so bad that it creates a fever and nausea. Okay, I did it when I was little. We, I played all day in the sand and my legs were just blistered like crazy. Um, and then the LD50 for radiation doses is 500 rem. So employees at nuclear power plants, we wear dosimeters, film badges that tell half to the fact how much we were dosed with. We use uh, area monitors to tell real time where the contamination is. So if we know where the radioactivity is and we have our badge on, we're pretty safe because we can, we can work in our work area. We can test our hands, our feet, our clothing and everything to make sure that we're not carrying any contamination with us. And then our film badge will take sort of the environmental um, dose right and and so then they'll take that film they'll develop it and they'll look to see what your dose was uh, pantex operated at a lower limit of uh, 0.1 rem per year so if my film badge showed 0.1 rem say it, it was a fiscal year so before august 31st let's say i'm in june and my badge has added up over the quarters to get 0.1 then i would be restricted from going into any more radioactive areas and so then once September 1st came along, then I could go back to work in those areas. And so they would hold me to an administrative limit of 100 millirem per year. Um, at power plants, they hold a 500 millirem per year uh, in three months. So they, if they get an exposure of that in three months, they, they call them, they're burned up. And then they can't work in radioactive areas uh, until the next year. And so this is a way to keep it. Look how, much, how low those limits are compared to the threshold. It'd be 25,000 millirem, and they're holding us at 100 or 500. And so that's what they're doing. They're following this thing called ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. In other words, can you have enough employees to share the duties working with radioactive materials or radioactive zones that you can keep it to 500 or keep it to 100? We're going to try to keep it as low as reasonably achievable and still get our job done. So that's what ALARA is. And so that's, um, that's a little bit about radiation measurements and doses and, and working in, in the industry.